damn it, I guess it's time I explain to these good people the upcoming fiscal cliff. Think of the economy as a car and the rich man as the driver. If you don't give the driver all the money, he'll drive you over a cliff. It's just common sense. Every time we buy something or choose not to, we're casting a vote. And I think that vote is more important than the ones we cast, at least in the United States, at the polls. All right, guys, welcome to uh, this week's Grime America show. <laughs> the last Grime America show recorded out of this uh, studio. We are moving again. Final move, hopefully. Yeah, you uh, said last of the igloo, but... Last of the igloo. Or maybe the next one will be a tree fort. Kind of woody in there. Wood paddling. Yeah, we're still in fucking the Calgary tundra. Yeah, but it's summer. The teepee. Coming to you are we going to change it? See, are we going to have a seasonal studio? A seasonal studio, yeah. We move into the wigwam when it warms up. Hey, you'll be right at home there, yeah. Mr. What did you call yourself? A Canadian Indian? Can Indian. That's right. Getting some Indian tobacco. Organic Indian poacher tobacco. And they're going to start smoking starting tomorrow. Jared, he's, uh, Darren's talking about quitting smoking. Yeah, I, I bought that up once before. Yep, I'm switching. Gonna do it with them. Apparently, more than once I hear. I'm gonna switch to organic <laughs> tobacco for a while first. I think. Uh, uh, what's that? American Spirit. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> How's it going, buddy? We should introduce you, Jared Drake, yeah, hey, yeah. coming from New Zealand. Yeah, Jared. I'm a Pisces. Like long walks on the beach. I'm a Pisces too. I too like log walks on the beach. Yeah, happy birthday, bro. Didn't get a chance to do it verbally. And you yeah, guys are you quitting too. smoking together? What's going on with you two? Are you We're dating? Dating? <laughs> well, I didn't even know we had the same birthday. We just kind of found that out that no. week. So how are you guys doing? Good. It's ready for the move? Yeah, the studio's pretty well gutted. All that's left is the desk. And the entire house is pretty well gutted by this point. So the big move is Saturday, and we have to have everything up and running again for Tom Roberts on Tuesday. Nice. Good work. Have you got a um, a team starter, everybody out there to help you out? Yeah, I'll have quite the crew on Saturday, and then hopefully me and Graham can find some time Sunday to set the studio back up. Okay. Otherwise, we'll just be like sitting on the floor with our legs crossed holding microphones. And we need to get it set up because we have uh, that meditation podcast in studio on the 29th. Oh, man. Who's that with? Just a couple of local doctors and... Uh... Some people in the meditation community that lead meditation groups and stuff like that in Calgary. Nice. Yeah. Look, nice. look at the scientific evidence on it. and Yeah, it's going to be good. Speaking of meditating, I see you got your... Uh... I see you merging with your technology in front of you. Yeah, my biofeedback inner balance device from HeartMath. That's the thing Howard Martin was talking about, right? That's right, yeah. So we're going to do a live thing here, see who can go green fastest. Should we time it? Are you you started? Don't start yet. We're going to time it. No, I'm just trying to get it working. I think the sensor timed out, so. The, The hard thing with all that sort of stuff is I use a Samsung, so I'm an Android sort of a guy. But because that's an uh, iPhone app, I need to also have an iPhone. So I'm going to be walking around with so much more Wi-Fi around me that I think it's probably going to be detrimental to what the benefits could be. <laughs> you just have to get rid of your Samsung. <laughs> no. They have an Android app for it, I think. The wars of the yeah. future will be fought between Apple and Samsung. Yeah. In the Starbucks Galaxy. Oh, I'm supposed to attach it to my ear. I'm trying my finger, but it's not working. Here, give me that fucking thing. To your ear. Right. He's hooking it up to his ear. Yeah, I can see. No. Oh, yeah, you no can see. Well, the detected. people listening can No pulse detected. Yeah. Yeah, I'm dead. Gra- oh, fuck. Graham's dead. CPR. Call 911. Just keep pumping. Uh-oh. Don't breathe. Just pump. Oh, it's doing something. Okay. Shh. They're going here, here, wait. I have the perfect thing. Warm it up. Somebody keep, are you, is somebody timing this? Oh, 
harsh red right now. Now I'm trying to improve my heart rate variability to improve the coherence of my, my heart, the electromagnetic frequency. Focus, Graham. Focus. Fucking focus! <laughs> he's into the blue, I think. No, I'm into the green already. Are you? Wow. Oh, he's green. Shall, shall I try? Where does it say you're in the green? I don't get it. Oh, that's you? You're the bars? What's the rainbow in the middle? Just for looks? Well, that's silly. It's confusing. It's an attractive app. It is a, it is a pretty attractive app. Yeah, it's a very professional app. Like it's it's a whole the whole the whole thing is well done. That's what we need to do the grammar app. We need to get in touch with the heart math people. It's really easy for people to sort of um, walk past this sort of stuff, but I seriously think that you know the the way that your heart works and how everything goes. Like you look at road rage, for instance, your heart gets going, everything gets pumped up, and people are freaking out, and decisions are made that are not. So are you still in the green? Well, now more red is showing up. So I think because Jared's talking about road rage. Oh, so you're getting pissed <laughs> off? <laughs> Sorry. So what was your point there again? It was that, that this Just stuff the, is... You know, there's, you work as a whole. You know, you've got your brain, you've got your heart, you've got your stomach, you've got all, all the bits and pieces that make you up. And um, we all think uh, that your brain controls everything. But there's so many different facets here. There's so many different things that do different different things and who knows if decisions are made based on just your brain or the rest of your body as well just like the whole heart math thing is <clears throat> yeah or like a gut feel right am i green exactly am i living in the green here uh no you've got more blue showing we're just starting to play around with this now so we don't really know exactly how it works but we don't really know at all how it works. the circle <laughs> is almost filled up completely it's mostly red. Oh, I see flashes of green over there. Yours didn't do that. I'm super chill. I just want to. It's, watch it's this, almost this. finished the circle, so we want to see Darren, who's only meditated in the sensory deprivation chamber once, is trying to trying to slow his heart down. So how does it do it? Is it based on pace, speed, tempo? That's yeah, a heart rate variability. So it's the variability of your of your heart rate at a minute level, I think. Okay. Is he getting there? He looks like he is. Up there. Just hang, hang on there. There's one more little notch to go and then the circles. Yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of blue and red in there, so the green's disappearing pretty quick. I think his... Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> come on, green. Come on! Ooh, it's not going to work. Come on! Yeah, so we're going to have to play around with this a little bit and then we'll, we'll start... Uh, coming up with a baseline and trying to train ourselves into more of a loving and compassion state. And you guys get to listen to the whole thing. How much was that, Graham? Uh, it wasn't much. I think it was 130, 140 bucks. Basically, I got this... Uh, I know, they paid for the app. This attachment, attachment that you can put to your ear, you plug it into your iPhone, and then I just download an, a free iPhone app. And, that's and all you should have it. your Wi-Fi in airplane mode while you do that. And I can share this with other people, or you can like put it on the cloud, and you can measure measure your results over and over, like trend analysis type stuff. You could send your coherence report to Facebook. Now it's almost all green, and it's not attached to anything. <laughs> Perfect. So the app prefers if you're dead. No pulse is green. Cool. Yeah, that is kind of cool. That's what I wonder if I could hook that thing up to my. Uh, Bulletproof. If Bulletproof. you could hook that up as a heart rate monitor instead of using this stupid flash. Maybe. Yeah, who knows? Okay, so here I've I've finished the results. Um percentage of time spent in each state of coherence. Now this is Darren and I sharing this experience. In the low state of co coherence, which is the red, it was nineteen percent, thirty seven percent in the medium, and forty four percent in the high state of coherence. Length of time was uh Five minutes and the achievement level i guess is is 26 and there's a graph of coherence over time so actually the highest level of coherence is when darren took it off his ear and put it on the table and i forgot to stop the session so <laughs> <laughs> 
130 bucks well spent. Yeah. So you got to try not to have a heartbeat. Pretty much. That's. No, I, I know. I think it's more about about the state. Like apparently, if you put yourself in a loving, loving is actually subjective. So I think it's supposed to be compassion and and peace, that type of thing. Peace and love. And so if you basically, some people say that emptying their mind or clearing their brain will help, and then it'll bring your heart into a coherent state. So relax. Just Maybe. relax. Yeah. Jamaica yeah. make crazy. <laughs> Terrible. That's a segue to welcoming Jamaica. Oh, I oh, thought we had Jamaica before. No, well, no. we do. Just the other day, we got her. Again, Jamaica's a tricky one. Could be like Dominican, where it could just oh, be one of an, yeah. our others vacationing. I didn't get anyone. Nobody emailed me or tweeted me and said they were on vacation in Dominican, so I'm taking that as a solid, solid uh Country. Country. And Good so work. if nobody tweets me and says they're in Jamaica, then uh, I'm taking that too. And if, if it is somebody on their vacation, thanks for downloading Grand America on your vacation. Yep. Thanks for paying $45 to download the Grand America show on roaming. Hopefully it's <laughs> worth it. Well, good on you, Jamaica. Yeah. I hope they're not jerking us around. <laughs> Coming from a chef. Yeah. Yeah, I had to slip that one in there. Nice work. So what's coming up, guys? Come on. What's coming up? What have we got this week? We got Mr. John Perkins today, the economic hitman himself, the original economic hitman, the ex-economic hitman. We don't want to make it seem like he's still... No, he partake. gave it up. But he's got a real positive attitude on on the future and on our potential. As, it's a good follow-up to Estelin, yeah, who probably they, depressed a lot of people, like Jared was saying. Dude, yeah. that shit really fucking made my day not... Yeah, it was bad. Afterwards, I, after hearing that sort of stuff, it was just full-on, like, you know, the only thing he came up with at the end of it was just be nice to other people. Yeah, It'll be good. Yeah, you still know? in kind of pisses on you, pisses on your future. Well, Perkins kind of wipes it off a little bit. He's got some <laughs> ideas on how we can fix it. So he's a jizz lobber. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, he's he's uh, he's very very optimistic. Which, uh, yeah, it's well, that's a good thing. Yeah, you that's need people like that. You can't just be yeah. fucked. And if we are whatever, fuck it. You can't just whine about it. Yeah, but we'll it's just... but it's a great interview and. It's a gooder, yeah, and the money bomb's going okay so far, yeah, can't complain. We got a postcard. Actually, Jared was the first one to ever send us a postcard and a bag of goodies all the way from New Zealand. But um, Chocolate bars. We actually just got one today. Terrible chocolate bars. Or oh, not, come on. I like them. Blame UPS. I, I ate most of them. The ones that were really fucking weird were like the pineapple ones. The, the pi pineapple like, lumps. Who eat, yeah, pineapple lumps. It's a terrible name, even. Oh. But the chocolate was good. Over here, there's an advert for those things, right? The pineapple lumps. And it's like everybody's sitting at a round table, like a UN meeting or something like that. And it was God giving out stuff to the world. And there were different countries. One of them got oil. One of them got this. One of them got that. And New Zealand goes, pineapple lumps. <laughs> and they got that. God gave us pineapple lumps. Sweet. Because they're amazing. Do you guys have fucking pineapples there? Do pineapples grow there? Yeah. They, they don't grow here. No. So you're, Just about everything's shipped in here. So by divine intervention, you have pineapple lumps. That's right. You took divine. And that's what you guys picked? Yeah, unfortunately, yes. Yee, too bad you couldn't have like a... Kiwi covered in could chocolate. I a, could I have a repick? <laughs> no, Are there kiwis right. there? There must be. There must kiwi be kiwis. We've got a shit ton of kiwi fruit. There you go. I could live on kiwi. So anyway, yeah, big thanks to, this is another one from Over the Pond, actually, uh, from uh, Patrick in... South London or something? Wandsworth, Wandsworth, South London. So he sent it in. It says, hi, Darren and Graham. Actually, you know, we should mention the last episode, Daniel Estelin, uh, was his music that we put on. He's got the... the Sanskrit. Sanskrit.com, uh, his record label there. Yeah, it's so, very appropriate. Yeah, exactly. Stuff. Yeah. I enjoyed that stuff. Yeah, good. 
Yeah, he's got uh, some more there. We're going to be uh, working with him in the future and hopefully getting some more of his stuff on here. But anyway, he sends a postcard. It's pretty cool. The Great Foot Race. The first match in 1862 of the Great Seneca Indian Runder at the Copenhagen Grounds. And he says, Hi, Darren and Graham. I discovered the show only recently th listening through to Red Pill Junkie on Radio Mysterioso. Really enjoy it. Have been catching up on the past episodes. I'm based in Wandsworth, South London, and I'm at Sanskrift on Twitter. Sanskrift, no T. On Twitter. Thanks for the follow. Cheers, Patrick. That's uh, postcard number two. And uh, we got a couple more email addresses we had we gave away. And um, Money Bob's off to a good start. So we did have one person emailed in asking about subscribing for more. I'm not going to put any more buttons on there. But if you do want to randomly subscribe for more, a different amount than $5, just email me and I can uh, email you a button of whatever number you choose. And it turns out to subscribe, you have to have a PayPal account. Yeah, otherwise you have to hit the, the donate button, right? If you don't have a PayPal account. Yeah, the donate button will work without PayPal, just with a credit card, but not the subscribe. You need to, they force you into a PayPal account. But yeah, we want to thank everybody so far that's contributed yeah, thanks, to the money thanks. bomb. Because, you know, so if far, it keeps so. going like this, then there'll be, uh, there'll be something given back to a lucky listener. It's a very cool concept. I like the model. And um, higher side chats, you know, it's a good idea to come up with it in the first place, and I think it should be spread around. It's good that you guys have taken it on board and um, are using it and making it a new thing, making it a new meme through the podcasting. Yeah, hopefully it gets around. It's kind of like we never wanted to to do bonus content or anything like that. One reason because we didn't have time, and the other just because it kind of limits the audience of who's going to hear it and. It's really just about, you know, spreading the word as far as we can. Good on you. That's the bottom line. <laughs> so how about before I forget, I do the UFO quote. Oh, shit, son. I forgot I'm all about the UFO this. quote. Have you got oh, that theremin? Too, so. I've been begging you to get a theremin for this. Oh, yeah. I got to take you to the store to we'll buy some stuff like that. Theremin store? Yeah. Fuck yeah. <laughs> theremin store. Okay, There's, so um, every corner ever in Canada. Yeah, oh yeah, these yeah. fuckers are everywhere. <laughs> Those theremin drive-throughs. <laughs> awesome. It's what you want. It's what you need. So this is Graham's profound UFO quote of the week. Boom, boom, boom. Ready? We need a jingle. Okay. There is a jingle. I edited it after. First of all, I told a magazine this past January that as an underdeveloped country with regards to the UFO problem, Japan had to take into account what should be done about the UFO question and that we had to spend more time on these matters. In addition, I said that someone had to solve the UFO problem with far-reaching vision at the same time. Secondly, I believe it is a reasonable time to take the UFO problem seriously as a reality. I hope that this symposium will contribute to peace on Earth from the point of view from outer space and take the first step towards the international cooperation in the field of UFOs. From the point of view of people in outer space, all human beings on Earth are the same people, regardless of whether they are American, Russian, Japanese, or whoever. Now that's from the Japanese Prime Minister Toshiki Kafu from an interview with students of Waseda University in Tokyo, November 1989. Beautiful. Well wow. done, sir. And that kind of rolls into Spam Gram Month, because <laughs> now all our Japanese listeners, uh, there are a few, can email Graham and tell him how bad he fucked up the pronunciation. Of the Prime Minister? Yeah, how, how bad could it be? Toshiki Kafu. Kaifu. Ah... Uh, doesn't sound right maybe it's right hey anyways either way it's a fucking prime minister talking about ufos like this why is anybody listening that was in 89 89 i was eight. that is pretty profound i mean come on a prime minister like the the leader of a nation somewhere 25 years couples. later yeah that's Nothing. pretty profound that guy's dead that's why talking about ufos out in public <clears throat> Two, two to the head. 
<laughs> or he's flying away, one or the other. Yeah. So, do you have anything uh, for us, Jared? Uh, not a hell of a lot, you know. It's um, everybody's still looking for a plane, and um, that's that's a bit of a hard one to follow because there's so much shit coming through. Like, you know, you can check your phone every hour, and there's completely different theories going on. Pilot pirates. Pirate. Did you hear that one theory? Pirate. Did Pirate. you hear that one newscast that that talked about this object slowly flying in around that area? Like it's insinuating it could be a UFO. Negative. Wow. No, I didn't hear that one. I think it's pirates, man. So it was Valentich. Yeah, he's oh. playing. Uh, his plane disappeared, isn't it? Yeah, yeah that's Valentich. the. Valentich. Yeah. Australia? Yeah, yeah. That is just, that's fucked. That's right by you, man. Watch out. Yeah, I know. Keep your eye out. You yeah, have a boat? Flying. No, I'm going to be on, I'm just on foot the whole time now, not flying. That's it. Flying's done for you. But don't you find it hard to, to follow these stories, these mainstream big stories that the media gloms onto anyways? Like, I really have a hard time knowing what to believe. I was talking to my buddy for uh, coffee the other day, and, and we were talking about how we are like the generation that doesn't know what to believe because there's so much crap out there. Uh, yeah, okay, the generation, but we are the ones that are looking into it. You know, we're the ones that are actually questioning and having opinions about it and not being force-fed. Like yeah, because before us, people. you were the generation that had to believe that you could believe the shit that they were wanted you to believe as being the truth. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. That's a good way to look at it, Jared. It, uh, I mean, we're the ones listening to this podcast right now. Okay, so we're... we're broadened our spectrum as far as uh, doing the dragnet through information that's out there. And so we're listening to this stuff and, and talking about it and trying to figure things out for ourselves as opposed to what we're getting force-fed from fucking CNN Domino's uh, version of it. I don't even have fucking cable anymore. I don't Cut watch it. that shit. That's why it's hard for me to know what... Uh... Who knows? I mean, uh, it's one of those things I think you just got to wait, wait it out. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah, too we, much we shit going on. And there's too many different stories and different takes, and the internet's just flooded with crap. Just I'd actually like give to it see a month. the timeline. The timeline of this, if you could, you know, when we get a conclusion, when we get to the point at the end of it, I'd love to see what the timeline actually looks like. If you could actually splice all those different stories into it and see where they popped up and how they rolled, and and who generated them. Yeah. Yeah, because I was just reading one about one of the buddies, and they're saying, oh, no, uh, there was a fire on board that affected the uh, black box. That's why he made a left turn. You know, it's eh, one of his friends, you know, and, and you just don't know where this information is sourced from. A plane took off. They don't know where it is. That's about all we know. Yeah, I agree. I still think it's probably in the ocean. So do you think? That we'll ever find out where it was then? Eventually. Or, or will we know what to believe in when apparently the truth does come out? We can have opinions. Yeah. I mean, that's the hard thing, you know? It's like, do you really know? Like, what was that France Airlines that took them two years to find the black box? Oh, I thought, yeah, maybe even longer, maybe three years. Yeah. So who knows where this one ended up? Speak, but, um, speaking of not knowing what to believe, I'm like 80% of the way through listening to 1984 <laughs> on Audible. And it was a good good choice. Great, great fucking book. Yeah, well, next uh, on Audible, you can listen to Alan Carr's Easy Way to Stop Smoking. Yeah, that's a, that's <laughs> fun. And, of course, if you guys want to listen to either, either of those great books or any more, Thanks, go Graham. to audibletrial.com slash grimerica yes i will line up 1984 yeah it's a gooder yeah uh, is that how it works we're gonna s stop smoking and you're gonna listen to 1984 yeah yeah there's, Sweet. there's like a bit of a balance shift here i i did my quitting okay I, i'll take that i'll take that i was sick of feeling like a slave to nicotine 
Dun, dun, dun. Now I'm just a slave to the our debt based economy. So these the listeners can listen to my mood slowly deteriorate <laughs> over the weeks so they quit smoking. Yeah. And then my eventual cave in. Dude, no disrespect, but the monotone, they're not gonna be able to pick it out. <laughs> <laughs> but we're gonna Perfect. miss that little giggle. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you fucks. <laughs> yeah, I'm feeling really bad today. <laughs> oh, hey, I know what I wanted to ask you, Jared. <laughs> What's up? The bulletproof. Did you ever try that? Yeah, man. The I bulletproof diet, yeah? Yep, still doing it. Really? Still how's how's that it? going? Um, I have lost about 12 kilos. 12 kilos? 25 pounds, 30 pounds. Yeah. Yep. Holy fuck. Eating so butter and drinking coffee? Yeah, yeah, I do it every day, doing the butter butter stick thing, you know, stick blender in there with the coffee. Um, not his coffee, but I'm doing <laughs> it with coffee. <clears throat> I'm doing it with coffee, and um, I'm using, like, uh, stevia, you know, the sweetener. It's uh-huh. not an artificial one. It, apparently, it's natural, but it's working. I've got plenty of um, coconut oil in my diet. Um, just using it as well on my body. And, and then you um, just can you do you eat food too? Yeah, yeah, you, you eat food on the <laughs> okay. diet too. Yeah, yeah, it's applicable. Yeah, all this um, stuff sounds great, but yeah, it's it's actually really simple. It's um, you just drop out all the carbs, and as a chef, you sort of understand how carbs work uh, to an extent. It's just potatoes, pasta, wheat, yeah, bread, you know, all that sort of stuff. Any Perfect. Sort of I like all those things. Uh, they're all gone. What? All gone. Yep. But you've got meat. You got, like, for me, I've been doing the, the meat, butter, you know, all that sort of stuff. I've been slipping in a bit of cheese. So like the Atkins diet, kind of? I thought he was yeah, saying it's, don't it's eat too close. much meat, though. Yeah, I've I've been slipping on the cheese, but still... It's it's I'm pretty close to what the diet is prescribed. I know, thought he what, I thought he thought we ate too much meat. That guy. I forget no. his name. And and, now. and who we're talking about is actually uh, is it uh, <laughs> it's the bulletproof executive. Yeah. And uh, yeah, his name slipped in my mind too. I have to look it up quickly. But hey, I'm I'm a, a product of. Um, my perusal and I've, I've figured out that this stuff works for me. And the thing is with diets, it's all individuals. It's all, it's all down to who you are and how your body works. And for me, this one works for me. For your free <laughs> trial of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's, it, it's interesting to me because hearing somebody talk about not needing to exercise. And if you eat these certain things and the way he explains the scientific, uh, what's his name? Activity. Of, of what's going on in your body. It's interesting to me because um, I work, I, I, I try and get lots of exercise and I try and eat pretty good and it's still difficult to, to get rid of the, get rid of that gut. I do 10,000 steps a day, which is what you do as a chef because you're walking around, you're on your feet all day. I don't, I'm terrible with actual exercise, but I'll, take the kids out on the weekend and we run around and do all sorts of shit and it's normally short bursts of running around playing tag doing this and that and that but um it's working i'm yeah. not going to question it dave asprey is uh who it is, right? it. there you go yeah. he's yep. can, is he canadian no yeah he lives in yeah, Van- on vancouver Island. he lives that, close but... to us so sorry to interrupt you there jared so <clears throat> you're saying that that's uh that's all the exercise you need is that what you're saying it's working. It's, I'm not saying it's all the exercise I need, but it is working. I've wow. gone down a couple of cup sizes here. <laughs> That's too bad. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's too bad you can just pick where you want it to lose. Yeah, I know. I'm still twerking, though. That's fine. Perfect. I was actually just twerking the other day. Trying nice. to. Yeah. Also getting laughed at. I suppose yeah. I'm... It is working for me, so um, I don't know. Everybody's got their own different body type and different things that they need in their diet. Um, 
but yeah, I'd have to say that it's working for me. Well, we're going to have to have Dave on one day to explain this in person. Yeah, we should have him on for sure. He talks about a lot of cool biohacking shit. Yeah. We should yeah. track him down. Yeah, for but sure. on, on that note, I suppose we should probably wrap it up. It's getting awfully late here in the igloo. Um, it's still nice and early for Jared tomorrow. Is it your weekend yet? No. No. No, it's Thursday tomorrow. Close. I wish it was Thursday tomorrow. Uh, you guys got anything else before we pop into a uh, break? No, I uh, I think that's it for me. That's right. it for me. All right, Jared. Well, thanks. Thanks, for, thanks, Jared. Thanks for coming on. Of course, uh, after the break here, we'll be listening to our interview with the economic hitman, John Perkins. Uh, great chat about how uh, corporations fuck over basically the entire planet and uh, how you can change it with how you spend your dollars. So. Yeah, and his latest book, Hoodwinked. Yeah, yeah. Enjoy. Uh, so we'll go to a quick break, guys. Enjoy the interview, and uh, we will catch you on the other side. Okay, guys, we got a big night here in Great America. We're going to be talking with the uh, former economic hip man, John Perkins. Uh, but first, how's it going tonight, Graham? Hey, Darren, I'm doing pretty good, buddy. It's a little warmer here. Yeah, warming up at the igloo, so things are looking good, and we're pretty <laughs> excited, eh? Uh, big fans of John's for a while. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we've got John Perkins, the original economic hip man himself here in Great America tonight. John's been blowing the whistle on the runaway corruption of the corporatocracy and the banksters at the highest level for years now. But not without solutions, though. John, ever the optimist, gives us hope and a blueprint of solutions. He's the best-selling author of Confessions of an Economic Hitman, The Secret History of the American Empire, and his latest, Hoodwinked. John is founder and board member of Dream Change and Pachamama, and he's won the Lenin Ono Grant for Peace in 2012, and the Rainforest Action Network Challenging Business as Usual Award in 2006. I listened to the Confessions book about five years ago as his message was starting to seep into the mainstream. Since then, I'm sure John's story of hope has reached all areas of our culture and society. And it's our absolute pl pleasure to be chatting with you tonight. John, welcome to Grime America. Thank you so much. It's great to be with you guys. I'm looking forward to the show. Yeah, yeah, it's it's super refreshing. One thing I, I really like about your books is, you know, a lot of people like to to bitch and complain and about the system that that we have, but uh, you're one of the few who 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 kind of rips it apart and then also, you know, paints a picture of how it could be. You know, I, I think it's uh, very important to 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 look at the right side, and and in fact, I'm I'm very encouraged by a lot of what I'm seeing around the world. We're in a we're in an amazing time in human history. I like to think of this as a consciousness revolution. And I think it may be the greatest revolution human beings have ever experienced, bigger than the agricultural or industrial revolution. Because we really are waking up to the fact that we have an extremely important role to play on this planet. And in recent years, we haven't done a very good job at it. So it's time to turn that around. So you must have switched, or or how did you change into this positive attitude? like? Uh, like Darren said, you're, you're full of solutions and was there something that clicked or something that happened when you decided to actually try and make the change yourself instead of just sort of writing about it? Well, you know, uh, before I ever wrote Confessions of an Economic Hitman, I published five books on indigenous cultures and shamanism. I spent a great deal of time in places like the Amazon and the Himalayas and the Andes and working with indigenous shamans and, and people who, who always believe that we can 
change anything we need to change. We, we just have to be willing to dream a new dream. Basically, you know, look at a new paradigm. I'm not talking about nighttime dream. I'm talking about, I'm talking about paradigm change. And then give that new dream energy. And, and it happens. And one of the things they said is, you know, you people in the North have been extremely successful. You had a dream of big buildings and lots of cars and heavy industry, and you gave it energy, and it's, it happened. It's been, it's been very successful, and you've created a lot of amazing things, great science, great medicine. People have walked on the moon. And we get you know astronauts coming back still from uh, from uh, outer space, uh, hanging out in those uh, uh, satellite and in, in, in those uh, what do you call those you know space stations up there roaming around, and we've created amazing art and literature and music, opera. I mean, it's, it's incredible what we've done. But as the indigenous people t- t- say, we we went a little too far, and now we're beginning to understand that, that this dream has become a nightmare. We need to change it. And they always have tremendous hope that, 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 that they're completely assured that we can change it. All we have to do is recognize it as a problem, define a new dream, and, and give it energy. So that's really what drives me. And also the fact that as I travel around the world, and in the last year I've, been, I've covered a great deal of this planet, from Southeast Asia to the Middle East to Europe and Latin America and North America, I see people all over really waking up and demanding change. Have you seen a, a difference in the last five or 10 years on that front? Huge, huge difference. Uh, Confessions of an Economic Hitman came out a little less than 10 years ago. Yeah. And in those early years when I was on an extensive speaking tour, uh, and in fact, I still am, but <laughs> in those days, you know, especially when I met with young people, students, MBA and, and law school students, uh, I would always arrange to have dinner with anywhere from a dozen to three dozen of them. And I'd ask them what their goals are. And they, in those days, they would always, the primary goal that I would hear was uh, to get rich and have power. I don't hear that anymore. Now I hear, I want to have kids. And I realize that this world that we're creating is not a world I want to bring kids up in. So my goal, why I'm going to college, why I'm getting these degrees is to create a, a better world, a sustainable world, a socially just world, a world my kids and grandchildren will thank me for creating. I've seen tremendous change in the last 10 years, and especially in the last five years. So did, when Confessions came out, did you expect that that you would be such a big part of this change? Like, did you, did you even, could you even dream or foresee that when you first uh, wrote Confessions? <laughs> No, you know, it's, it's, I suppose, it's just, uh, you know, I talk about changing the dream and so on. I suppose I had a kind of a dream that it would have an impact or I wouldn't have bothered to write it. Yeah. But I had, uh, you know, no idea that it would have such a huge impact. And, and what was funny is, is once it was written, um, I have a good agent in New York and it was rejected by 39 publishers. Uh, for political reasons, my, my literary agent had told me that it probably would be a very hard get published because editors would be afraid uh, that it might be exposed as not true. Uh, you know, there's been a number of books where that's happened, and, and, they, and, and it was just too controversial. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we got a lot of rejection letters, and at that point, I'm like thinking, well, hell, this book's never going to get published, you know. And then a small publishing house in San Francisco that was on the verge of bankruptcy uh, published it, and it immediately uh, went to, to, uh, to the New York Times best, bestseller list and stayed there for about a year and a half. It now sold millions of copies. It's in, I think, close to 40 languages. Um, and I just came back from Istanbul two weeks ago where I was speaking there to a major a corporate conference, 2,000 corporate executives. And it's been, it's been fascinating, you know, where this book has taken me and, and uh, I'm very grateful that I'd have the opportunity to speak out on these issues. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of nice to get that platform to kind of to kind of accelerate accelerate things. Um, for the for the few uh, people in our audience who might not uh, really know what we're talking about, could you give us a quick rundown of what exactly an economic hitman is and what they're up to? I think it's fair to say that economic hitman has created the world's first truly global empire. And it's the first empire that's been created primarily without the military, but through economics, primarily through debt. And the way we, well, we work many different ways, but perhaps the most common 
is that we identify a country that has resources, our corporations covet like oil, and then arrange a huge loan to that country from the World Bank or one of its sister organizations. But the money never actually goes to the country. Instead, it goes to our own corporations to build infrastructure projects in that country, things like electrical power systems, and industrial parks, and highways, things that, that benefit a few wealthy families in that country, as well as our own corporations who are the main beneficiaries, but don't help the majority of the people. They're too poor to buy electricity. They don't have cars to drive on highways. They can't get jobs in industrial parks because they don't hire many people. And yet they're left holding a huge debt. Because of that debt and the, the attempt to pay off the interest on that debt, uh, they have to forego education and health care and other social services. And then at some point, because they can't, the, the, the debt ultimately cannot be paid, we go back and say, since you can't pay your debts, uh, sell your resource, oil or whatever it is, real cheap to our corporations without any environmental restrictions or social regulations, uh, and sell off your, your public sector businesses like to our, to, to our corporations, privatize and, and our, your electric utilities, your water and sewage system, your schools, your prisons, sell them to our corporations at cut rate prices, allow us to build a military base on your soil, all those sorts of things. And that's really been, we've been building this very subtle empire uh, it's been built through debt, through economics, rather than through the military. Although I will say, in the cases when economic hitmen fail, the jackals come in and either overthrow or assassinate the leaders of the countries that haven't played the game. And in, in my books, I described how this happened to two of my clients, so the democratically elected president of Ecuador, Jaime Roldos, and Omar Torrijos of Panama. They would not accept these onerous deals, and as a result, they were both assassinated. And when the jackals also fail, as with Saddam Hussein and uh, uh, Gaddafi of, of Libya, uh, then the military goes in. So is this also not only about resources, but about getting these countries off their own currencies and, and uh, as part of the World, World Bank kind of debt-based economy? Because we're almost we're almost done now, right? With that takeover, like there's only what six or seven countries left that might have their own currency, in a sense. Well, yeah, it's it's yeah, it's about empire building. It's, tr it's a true form of imperialism, uh, but not a not militarized imperialism for the most part. And one of the uh, characteristics of an empire is that it imposes its currency on the rest of the world. But, you know, and, and, and we've essentially done that. So there's still a lot of countries that have their own currencies. We've got the Euro or European, Europe. We've got many Latin American and African and Asian countries have their own currencies. But the fact of the matter is, on international trade, everybody use, uses the dollar. Uh, oil, petroleum is bought and sold in, in lump sums, at least, in large amounts internationally for dollars. Uh, so, in fact, there is one world currency, and that's the dollar, although there are small currencies, you know, localized currencies within that system, but, but, but they're not allowed to uh, prevail in any sort of international uh, network. Is it primarily, like, uh, is it primarily a Western thing, or, like, is there is there Eastern powers that are kind of up to the same same shit? Well, this is a corporate empire. This is This is not an American empire. Uh, one of my books, uh, Secret History of the American Empire, it has that title, but the fact of the matter is, and in that book I talk about how many of these corporations are based in or get started in the United States, but the truth of the matter is the United States government is a pawn of these corporations, as is the World Bank and the IMF. Um, State Department works for them, the CIA and NSA work for them. They certainly don't work for me, an American citizen. They don't work for any of us <laughs> American citizens. <laughs> they work for big corporations. And so, you know, we see the rise, for example, of, of China and the economies of India and Brazil and many, many countries are raising their economy. But in fact, all of these are very much based on big corporations, too. China wouldn't have the economic growth that did it if it were not for multinational corporations that have taken their products worldwide. China has done a lot 
in and of itself uh, to encourage labor, cheap labor, and fairly skilled labor, and so on. But the fact is, big corporations are calling the shots. And so this really is a corporate empire. And, and people, the corporatocracy of the people that I, the name I use for people who run this empire, um, they don't really care what country they're in. You know, so you get a, you get a company like Halliburton that moved from the United States to, uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, Dubai um, because it was to its advantage to do so. Uh, and, and we see this sort of thing happening all the time. And these countries, these, these countries don't consider themselves, they may call themselves American or, or whatever, but they really don't consider themselves that way. They, they have branches all over the world. They have subsidiaries that they can use so they can hide their money and offshore accounts at, at whatever country seems to be the most convenient for that. And they can go into other countries and strip the country of its resources and so on and so forth. They're truly global companies with no no loyalty to any nation. Certainly, they don't. Many of them don't even pay taxes in the United States. It's funny that you mentioned Dubai because you, when you when you look back at it, almost see, you can almost see how Dubai has been kind of built up as like a a little escape plan for when uh, things get too bad over here. Hey, you might look at it that way, huh? <laughs> um, isn't the, one of the main problems with the economy? Like you're starting to hear more and more about this, about how it's all based on debt, like how, um, you know, they're basically creating money out of thin air and loaning it at interest and not enabling, um, you know, public banking or, or governments to issue their own tender, not, not with debt. So can you talk about that a bit? It, it, it sort of frustrates me when I try and talk to people about this, like people get caught up in the political stuff, like left or right or, you know, um, Republicans and Democrats and all this kind of distraction when really it seems pretty simple that the problem is like all the way at the top and the way money's issued. And yeah, certainly the way money is issued is, is a major factor in all of this. And the kind of the philosophy, I guess you'd call it, of, of corporations, uh, the idea that the only responsibility of business is to maximize profits, regardless of the social and environmental costs. And that goes along with the way money is handled also, that this idea that, that, that debt is a good thing, where in fact debt is an enslaving thing. It's, it's shackles. It shackles people. There's no question about it. But, you know, when I went to business school in the late 60s, we were taught that a corporation, a CEO, should focus on making a decent rate of return for his investors. That's the only way you can attract money. Um, but we were also taught that that was not the only goal by any means, that, that a good CEO also took good care of his employees, gave them health care and retirement pensions. And a good CEO would take a cut in salary before laying anybody off. Man, does that change? And we were also taught that a good CEO takes good care of his, uh, his, uh, his suppliers, the people that supply the basic goods for his, for his uh, products, and his customers, and the communities where his business operates. He's a good citizen. The company's a good citizen. It not only pays taxes, but it also invests in schools, recreation centers, and so forth. And then in the 70s, when Milton Friedman, one of Chicago's, at the Chicago School of Economics, won the Nobel Prize for saying that the only responsibility of business is to maximize profits, suddenly everything changed. And we really need to move past that. That's, that's an absurd, it's a terrible, it's a terrible, terrible guiding principle for business to say the only responsibility is to maximize profits. I think we have to go back to something that the United States was, was prevalent and from the time this country was a country for about 100 years. No corporation could get a charter unless it proved it was going to serve a public interest. Hmm. The charter lasted about 10 years, and after that, a corporation had to demonstrate that it had served the public interest, and we continue to do that in order to get its charter renewed. That all ended in the late 1800s when the Supreme Court decided the corporations had the rights but not the responsibilities of individuals. I think we need to revisit that idea that a corporation has to serve a public interest. It should serve the 99%, not just the 1%. Yeah, that's a good point. 
that's one of the things I liked about your book too, or your books. You, you talk about it in a couple of them is, I mean, for most people battling the whole corporate world and identity seems very daunting, but you talk about some success stories and you talk about actually really trying to change the, the structure of corporations or their, their goals. Can you talk about that a bit? You know, I, I like to take two courses when it's dealing with how we change corporations. And, and one is uh, when I speak with what I'll call the consumer, I speak of things like green festivals and a lot of big uh, um, conferences and, some, and, and summits and things like where, where there are just a, a great many people out there or at universities. And, and I tell these people, the marketplace is a democracy if you if we only choose to look at it as such and use it as such that every time we buy something or choose not to we're casting a vote and i think that vote is more important than the ones we cast at least in the united states at the polls every year because our our, our uh, politicians are controlled by corporations let's face it there's no question about it and we've used that marketplace idea very successfully whenever we've really applied it so back when i was in college there was apartheid in South Africa. We got rid of it by boycotting corporations that supported it. Rivers were terribly polluted in the United States, including some on fire in Ohio and other places, and we forced corporations to clean them up. We forced corporations to open their doors wider to women and minorities and to label foods for, for nutrition and you know, how many calories they've got and so on and so forth. We've been very, very successful at changing corporations, when we've really set our minds on doing that in specific areas, I think now what we need to do as consumers is demand that these corporations set a new guiding principle, and that is instead of maximizing profits, regardless of social and environmental costs, to recognize that it may be necessary to pay a, rate of, a decent rate of return to their investors, but that they need to serve a public interest. And in fact, one of the things that I tell corporate executives is that you need to be looking at how to move beyond what I call a death economy into a life economy. And it, we've been living in this death economy for many, many years now. This is an economy that's based on militarization to a very large degree. Mm -hmm. And it's also based on ravaging, destroying, pillaging, raping the earth, destroying resources, killing resources. And now it's time to move into a life economy one that's based on cleaning up pollution all over the world, air, water, soil pollution, provides jobs for people to do this and technologies. One that's based on helping starving people grow food more efficiently and distribute it and store it and distribute it. One that's based on finding totally new means of transportation and communication and energy and banking and retailing the things we haven't even imagined so far. I think there's a tremendous opportunity here for us to create a very vibrant economy, a full employment economy, and one that is dedicated to creating a world that our children and grandchildren will want to inherit. And in fact, all the children and grandchildren of, of all species, not just, not just human, but of all species. And, and I think this is an exciting time. And I tell corporate executives, hey, you know, the corporations that are going to be successful in the short term as well as the long term are those that recognize that we've entered a new period and we've got to move forward with a new vision and new goals. Yeah, I think you can really see that starting to take front. Like even on like one that I notice every day is on the food front, like where before I used to have to go to the grocery store to get some stuff and then I'd go to a farm or a farmer's market to get my meat because it's the only place you can get it, you know, free of hormones and antibiotics and everything else. Whereas now I can go to one grocery store and get everything because the people have kind of forced their hand at that. Is it, isn't something like that a little harder to do with the banking system? Because we don't really have a lot of options. Well, we do have options, and it's, it's happening. You know, in the North Dakota in the United States now ha has a state central bank that totally invests all of its money in helping the people of that state uh, live better and do business. And it's, it's the one bank in the United States that didn't suffer during the recent recession. Yeah, it's, I was going to ask you about that one. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been proven to be successful. Ecuador and, and many other Latin American countries are experimenting with new forms of central banks that, that work that way. So there are, new, there are other models out there. We need to look seriously at these. And, and, and I just read, I guess today or yesterday, that Vermont is now considering a, a central bank idea that's similar to the North Dakota one. And I, I understand that a lot of states are looking very, very seriously at this. Wow, that'll be a, that'll be a big change. It, w- it will be, if, and that's what we need. You know, and the United States needs that. Our, our Federal Reserve system is corrupt, and it's a total failure. Yeah. So, since you went from uh, from being uh, being a, an EH or an ECH, EHM, EHM, <laughs> from an EHM to to kind of being an uh, an outer of them, there must have been like you must have been a little bit worried about the jackals uh, and your own safety at times. Well, that's a good story, <laughs> actually. Um, back in the early 80s, after I, I uh, quit, I, well, I, 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 I quit uh, being an economic hit man. I started to write a book about it, and then I contacted other economic hit men and jackals and, to get their stories. And I very soon got very threatening phone calls, anonymous phone calls, threatening my life and my daughter. She was born in 82. Um, at the, 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 at about the same time, I was invited out to dinner by the chairman of the board of Stone & Webster, a big Boston, New York consulting firm, and a, a, a rival of my company, which I recently re- resigned from. And I've been chief economist at my company, and I have a very good resume. And this, this chairman of the board takes me up to dinner. And he says, hey, you know, you've got a great resume. You were one of our top competitors. We'd like to use your resume and proposals. You won't have to work for us. We're not going to ask you to do anything. Just let us use your resume, and I want to offer you a, a consultant's retainer of, of half a million dollars right now. <laughs> but don't write that book you're working on. And so I'm getting threats on the one hand and, and threats to my daughter's life as well as my own. And, and, uh, and then I'm getting this bribe. It's a totally legal bribe. What he was suggesting is, 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 is done in this business. And I'll tell you, you know, I knew what the jackals can do. I'd seen it. And so I took the money uh, and didn't write the book. Uh, and I have to say my own defense. I put the money to good use. I didn't go out and buy a fancy car or a big house or something. I... I financed a new, a new career for myself, which was going in, back to Latin America, where I've been a Peace Corps volunteer and working with indigenous people and trying to help them fight oil companies. And I wrote five books on those people, indigenous people and shamanism. That was okay with Stone and Webster. Uh, but I, you know, I, didn't, I didn't expose the economic hitman side of things. Then on 9-11, I was in Latin America. I was in the Amazon. When I came home, I went to ground zero, and as I stood there looking into that still smoldering pit, I decided I had to write this book. My contract with Stone Webster was over, and I, had, I was not legally bound to them. I, uh, but I decided that this time I wouldn't tell a soul I was working on the book. No, nobody. I would write the whole book, not a proposal. Like I knew it was the smart thing to do. You write a proposal. I mean, that's what you're supposed to do. Write a proposal, get in advance, write a book. I wrote the whole book, got it in the hands of a, a very good agent in New York, and at that point, it became my insurance policy. And even today, I mean, any good jackal knows that mm-hmm. uh, killing me will, will result in more, a lot more book sales. I'll become a martyr. The book sold millions of copies now, but it'll sell millions and millions more if uh, something strange happens to me. You just had to get it out there right away and... I had to get it out there, not, not threaten to get it out, not tell anybody I'm going to do this, but, but have the, the book written and then in the hands of all these major publishing houses and, and my literary agent. And, of course, now a lot of times has, has elapsed, and, uh, you know, we've got Michael Moore and, and lots of people doing lots of things. So, you know, it's, it's become much more common. Snowden and, and, and uh, Assange have certainly probably done a lot more damage than I did. Um, so it's become somewhat more standard that, that people are, are whistleblowers. Uh, and I have to say, I'm, I'm glad I, I kind of took a lead in that area and, and was smart enough to realize, or at least it had, my, had been threatened enough earlier, uh, to realize that the way to do it is uh, to keep it secret until the very last moment and then get it all out there at once.
in in your first book you kind of talk about um how when you first went to ecuador on your on your first gig you were already kind of feeling iffy about it um i guess I, I, how, how, why did it why did it take so long for you to to turn full circle well it took 10 years i was in, i was in the business for 10 years and uh, you know, it, it's. Uh, I was trained by this woman, Claudine, who I talk about in the book, a remarkable, a remarkable woman in Boston before I went on my first assignment. And, and actually, that first assignment was in Indonesia, and then Ecuador came later. But even, uh, you know, so Claudine really told me, she was pretty frank about what I was going to have to do, but I didn't wasn't sure I believed at all. And what I was being asked to do was not illegal. In fact, it's what's taught was taught and still is taught in, in major business schools and it's what's advocated by the World Bank and the IMF. Everybody will tell you, you know, and in most circles at least, that the way to help a developing country rise out of poverty is to invest billions of dollars in big infrastructure projects. And in fact, you can demonstrate that it's true, that when you do that, the gross domestic product, the, the, our, our main measure of economic growth, increases. What the statistics don't show is that really that gross domestic product is highly biased toward a few very, very wealthy families. The majority of the people in most of these countries aren't part of the official statistical system or only a very small part of their lives is part of it. A lot of what they do is, is, is trading. They, they, you know, it's, it's your fruits for my vegetables kind of thing in the market. A lot of what, even the cash transactions that go on are not ever recorded. And in fact, that's true in Canada and the United States too. You know, we're seeing that we can have what looks like a growing economy and at the same time a growing unemployment and more foreclosures on houses. And the reason for that is, is because when we see the growing economy, this is reflecting, you know, those, those very few people who control so many assets. It recently came up that 85 individuals control more assets than half the world's population. So when those people's when those people benefit, when, they, when, their, when their bank accounts grow, it looks like the whole world economy is growing, when in fact that may not be the case at all. And it took me a while to really understand this. Um, I began to understand it slightly on the very first trip, but it took a while to really have it dig in. And I have to say, you know, and I'm not proud of this, but I have to say that once I really began to understand it, I didn't want to understand it. I was living a pretty interesting life, traveling around the world, flying first class, eating in the best restaurants, staying in five-star hotels, whining and dining presidents and beautiful women. I mean, it's one, once I began to see uh, the problems of what I was doing, I, I really didn't want to. And I think that's a big thing to admit to that I think there's an awful lot of people out there that do understand that what they're doing is not right, but they don't want to really understand it. They want to convince themselves that what the business schools tell them, what the textbooks tell them, that, 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 that what they are doing is what should be done, even though in their hearts they, become, they begin to understand that it isn't so. So it took me a while to really face my own conscience and get the hell out. And I think I had an advantage over many other people in that I'd spent three years in the Peace Corps in the Amazon and Andes of South America, and I'd seen the people on the other side. So I, was, I had an education that most of the other people that were in my kind of position did not have. Uh, speaking of Claudine, did you ever uh, find out who was signing her paychecks? No. You know what? So she trained me for a number of months before I took my first assignment in Indonesia. I was there for three months. Uh, when I came back, she was gone. And I was devastated. I'd fallen in love with this woman, and, and I, w I was really devastated. But uh, she was nowhere to be found. And I give her a lot of detail in my books about all the things I did to try to find her. And it was pretty obvious at that point that she was a professional working probably for the National Security Agency or the CIA or somebody. Her, her card, her business card that she had said she was a special consultant to Charles D. Maine, which was a company I worked for. But I found that she was never on their role, ex uh, payroll except as a special consultant, and nobody would divulge any information about her. They said it was private. I don't think anybody in the company knew, knew, knew what she was doing, really. When I, when I heard... Uh confessions on audio there i seem to remember um your solution being somewhat spiritual too like either you you talking quite a bit about 
you know, spiritual matters, and I'm not talking religious here, but more spiritual. And it almost seemed like you had had some sort of spiritual awakening or were you always spiritual through your life or did that sort of change when you switch gears to sort of come out? Well, um, that's an interesting question. I, you know, I grew up in a, uh, like what I like to call a, a Puritan family in New Hampshire, Vermont. My, my ancestors go back about 300 years in New England and Puritan stock, you know, Calvinist, and so on. Uh, but my parents didn't really go to church, and I didn't. Really, I went to Sunday school. I never really went to church, but I, I was kind of steeped in that. And then when I went in the Peace Corps, and I was in the Amazon, I was deep, deep in the Amazon, living with indigenous people, and I got very, very sick. Mm. I was dying, and I couldn't get out. I was very deep in the Amazon. There was no way in my condition that I could get to a, 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 a real medical doctor as I knew them. And I, 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 I describe this in detail in some of my books, but the short story is that, that a shaman healed me. And it was an, an incredible experience. It was really a, a mind-altering experience in many respects. In that, in, in one night, what I saw on a, on a shamanic journey was that uh, my parents had brought me up to be very hygienic, wash your hands a lot, you know, and eat very simple foods. No, we were meat and potatoes sort of people, and we didn't eat anything very interesting. Well, the, the schwa, the indigenous people I was living with, don't know, didn't know what soap was. <laughs> it was the opposite of hygienic. Uh, and they, you know, the, the, the main drink was not, they don't drink water out of the rivers because it's too much organic matter. But they, the only thing they really drink is a kind of beer, that's made out of women chewing and spitting and manioc root into into containers, and then it ferments. And you oh. drink a hell of a you drink a hell of a lot of this beer because it's safe. Actually, it's you know it's fermented, <laughs> and you, you eat things like squirming live white grubs that come out of a rotting tree. I mean, you, you, these the foods, the things I was eating and drinking were totally uh, the opposite of what my parents had brought me up with, and I I ate and drank them because there weren't any. Cliff bars. <laughs> I didn't have any choice. And what I saw on this shamanic journey that night was that every time I ate or drank these things, I heard a little voice, my mom's voice, you know, saying, son, it'll kill you. And at the same time, I was seeing that the Shwa were very healthy people. They're hunters and gatherers, and the men are built like Rambo. They carry heavy weights through the jungle. The women are sexy and, and fertile and lots of kids. And people live to be very, very old if they don't you know, die from a snake bite or a tree falling on them in the, in the storm in the jungle or something, an accident. And so what I saw that night was that the food wasn't killing me. It's the same food they eat, and they're healthy. What was killing me was my mindset. And it was a, it was a phenomenal experience. Huh. The next morning, I, I was totally healthy. And I spent the next three years living with these people and never get sick again. Uh, the shaman required of me for payment for what he'd done for me that I become his apprentice, which I had no interest in doing, but it did because he'd saved my life. And that too changed everything in my life. And since then, I've studied with many shamans around the world. Um, so, and, and, I, and I'd say that shamanism and is very spiritual. It, you know, it really believes that the spirit and everything, and the trees and the rocks and the water, that, that everything, we're all connected. So, yeah, I'm very spiritual in that way. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I was brought up with an idea of Christ as a, as a very important person, and I've since regarded Christ as a great shaman, a great healer. He's a spirit guide of mine. I talk to him a lot. I, I wouldn't say that I'm, 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 you know, a traditional Christian. I don't go to churches or anything. But Christ is one of my spirit guides, and I have several others. And I really believe that we can be connected that way. And, and uh, I take great solace in that. And I, I, even today, I spend a lot of time traveling alone around the world. I just came from Istanbul, where I was speaking. Before that, I was in uh, Italy and Latin America and Vietnam and Myanmar and Thailand. And... and Oh, I'm alone a lot, but I'm never alone because I feel that I'm connected spiritually with, I guess, with the earth and the universe and everything in it. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful feeling. And it also means that I feel a deep responsibility for being a good steward, for taking care of these things and for passing on to my six-year-old grandson a world that he will want to inherit. And that means a world that every child on the planet will want to inherit of every species on the planet. 
Isn't it funny how you're starting to see a lot in our society of people taking off to, you know, South America, Peru, off to um, places like Thailand and Tibet on spiritual journeys. And it seems to be like a lot of people are, you know, the old ways maybe truly are the best ways. Well, I think we're, we're understanding that the connection that these indigenous people have with the earth and their understanding of relationship is one of the things that the Schwa taught me when, and once I started studying shamanism about uh, relationship. And it's something we don't learn in our schools, you know. We, we don't even learn much about relationship with people to say nothing about relationship with trees and the earth and the elements. And the indigenous people have always known that their lives depend on honoring those relationships. We've, we've tended to forget that, and now we're suffering a great deal because of that through pollution and destruction of resources. That's what I call this death economy, pillaging, raping, ripping up the earth, rather than understanding that the earth is indeed uh, something that we need to survive. People will call it our mother, and you could really say that in a way it is. It's, we suckle at the breast of the earth all the time, and we damn well better take care of uh, this planet that we live on. And I think people are really across the planet realizing this. And, you know, the fact that we can all communicate with each other uh, for the first time in history mm -hmm. is amazing. It's amazing. You know, instantaneously, you, you, you're, you know, you're, you're in Canada. I'm here. Uh, people probably around the globe are going to hear uh, our conversation. Uh, we can talk instantaneously with people everywhere on the planet today. And, we're also all understanding that for the, for, for the first time, we're understanding that we're all being threatened by the same crises. It's, it's not just blizzards in Canada and earthquakes <laughs> in San Francisco and hurricanes in Florida and tsunamis in Asia. Now we are all facing melting glaciers uh, and uh, rising oceans. We're all facing species extinction and resources that are declining at accelerating rates. And we're all communicating with each other. So we're getting it. We're really, truly waking up, I, I believe. And, 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 and in that process of waking up, we're understanding that our salvation lies in, in developing a greater appreciation for the relationship that we have with all other uh, forms of life uh, on this planet. And in fact, with, with the elements, with, with everything. It's just not, not what we just think of as life, but with, with what the shamans will tell you is the spirit of everything <laughs> and we're, 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 you know people are getting it they're really getting it and we need to get it that's that's a very important aspect and i and that's something i try to really you know convince businessmen of and business women that the executives that are running our big corporations we got to take care of these things do you think uh, well what's uh, what's an example of a good start like what's something that uh the people listening can start doing tomorrow to start working working the change? I think it, part of it is being conscious that corporations run the, run the world. It, it's not politicians. Uh, politicians are run by corporations in most countries. Um, and that corporations are totally vulnerable to us. Uh, we're the ones who determine what they're going to do and whether they're going to survive or not. A lot of major corporations have gone the way of the dinosaurs. And, and that's usually because they, they misjudge what people really want. And executives understand this, the smart ones do, and the smart ones are getting it. So I think everyone needs to understand the power that they have as consumers. Uh, and it's not, just, you can't, it's not just about shopping, it's about also sending a message. So, you know, I encourage people to send emails to companies like Nike and say, hey, you know, I love your products, and I want to buy them, but as long as you get slaves working for you in sweatshops in Indonesia, I'm not going to. Pay those people a decent wage, and I'll buy your products. You know, we need to send those emails. It's easy today to send emails and to sign petitions, and they do have a huge impact. There's no question about it. Beyond that, I'd like to tell people that every one of you has tremendous power. Just Identify a hero in your life, you know, whether that's Mother Teresa or Gandhi or whoever it is. Think of someone that you look at as a hero and realize that it's that person just started off like you, not knowing what they were going to do or whether what the steps they took were going to be successful or not. One of my heroes is 
uh, Rachel Carson, the woman who wrote the book Silent Spring, which should get, get, get DDT out of the United States and many other places and started a whole worldwide environmental movement. And I know that Rachel Carson was just a woman who sat down at a little desk in a tiny house in Pennsylvania and started scribbling out a book with a pencil on paper, having no idea that the book would ever be published, much less that it would change the world. And every one of us has that power. You know, we have the power to effect huge change. The important thing is for every person to identify, you know, what, what is your passion <laughs> and what are your skills? And go for that, you know, but direct those passions and skills toward changing the corporations, creating a sustainable, just, peaceful world. And, you know, I have a passion for writing and hopefully some skill in it. So that's where I direct most of my passions into doing some, you know, talk shows like this and, and, and put some public speaking. But every person out there has some passion and skills. I don't care whether you're a dentist or a carpenter or a plumber or a housewife or a house husband or whatever you are. You've got skills and passions and you can use those to create a better world for yourself, your children and grandchildren. And I think that's if we, if we just understand the power that we each have uh, and the fun of using that power to create a better world, nothing is more fun than feeling that we're doing something to make a better future. Yeah, it's definitely fun to follow your passion. One of the challenges yeah. I see right now, I was, I was having coffee with a friend last weekend and we were talking about these type of topics and and uh, the way the media is now and the new media and we're almost living in a generation like that we don't know what to believe like it's really hard to sift through everything now you know for every scientific you know study you hear about you hear about an opposite polar mm. study that that talks about something different <laughs> you know I, and it's hard even even with uh, nonprofits and NGOs you hear the good side and the bad side and with you know, the environment going this way or that. So it's really tough for me to sift through all this, this crap and, and get to the, the root. Yeah. Well, and I think that's healthy. Yeah, I was in a discussion a couple mm -hmm. of nights ago with a group of people. We're, we're sitting around having dinner, and we had, we had vegetarians, we had vegans, we had people that eat meat, we had all kinds of people. And there was a discussion going on, you know, about this study and that study, one that says you should eat a lot of protein, another one that says you don't need very much protein. And, <laughs> and you know, what we realize is that it's, it's probably, you know, one person's healthy diet is, is another person's murderous diet in a way. You know, I mean, we, we, we're, we're all somewhat different. And I think it's healthy that, that, there are, that we we're beginning to understand there are no real answers to a lot of this stuff that we're questioning these things rather than the old way, which we all used to believe in certain things and, and uh, you know, the four square meals and so on and so forth. Um, and to recognize that there probably is no objective truth. It's like the uh, quantum physicists say, it, 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 you know, the, the, the observer, observed, yeah. the observed is, is, is a partly a fu to a large degree a function of the observer. Mm -hmm. And in recognizing that, we also know that we need to listen to our hearts. And I think as, we, as I travel around this planet, what I find is that practically every human being out there from the corporate executives to ditch diggers uh, understands that there's a serious mistake that we've made, that human beings are not headed in a very good direction right now, and we've got to change. We're getting that. We're understanding that we're polluting ourselves out of existence. We're understanding that the great rivers of, uh, that come out of the Himalayas and, and, and provide water to a huge percentage of the world's population in China and India are drying up because the glaciers are melting because of climate change. People around the world are getting this, you know. We're understanding <clears throat> what I think is a very telling statistic that less than 5% of the world's population lives in the United States and we consume almost 30% of the world's resources. Well, that's as an, as an economic system, that's an adject failure. Half the world is starving or on the verge of starvation, while 5% is consuming 30% of the world's resources. That's not a model. 
China cannot replicate that, nor mm-hmm. can India, nor Latin America, nor Africa. They're trying to. Mm-hmm. But every time they, they make a step in the direction of actually replicating it, another glacier, glacier melts a bit more. The oceans rise a little bit more. There's more pollution. So we need to understand that the system that we've created is a total failure. Uh, you know, the, the American economic system is not a model. It's a failure. Mm-hmm. And, and so we need to come up with a new model. And that's where I go with this, you know, creating a life economy rather than a death economy, because the U.S. economy is a death economy. A huge percentage of it goes to killing people, to militarization, and then almost all the rest of it goes to ravaging the earth and, and exploiting people. We, we, we need to get out of that. And, and I think people are really beginning to understand that, whether you're talking about the Occupy movement or the Arab Spring or what's going on in Russia and China today, demonstrations in Canada, uh, Latin America, people are, are understanding and they're speaking out. Yeah, no, I like that, pers- I like that uh, perspective of the truth. That, that's, that is very helpful. And speaking of uh, people speaking out all over the place, what, what's your take on what's happening in Ukraine right now? It's, you know, it's hard for me to comment on places where I have no personal experience. Yeah. I, don't, I don't like to uh, speculate uh, very much. But, uh, and so I just recently wrote a blog, and I'd encourage your listeners to go to johnperkins.org. They can see that blog. They can sign up for my newsletter, which comes out about once a month. I do more blogs, but they receive mm-hmm. a newsletter, and then they can go and look for the blogs. Mm-hmm. Um, and in this blog, you know, I said, you know, I, I'm, I'm all for keeping Russia out of Ukraine, I'm, I'm, all, I, I'm all for sovereignty, and I don't know all the details behind it, but I think what this, this is a great time for my people in the United States to look at what we did in Panama in 1989 when we sent troops in and killed between two and 6,000 innocent civilians uh, without any real justification other than saying the Monroe Doctrine, which states that the United States uh, has an obligation and a responsibility uh, to interfere in Latin American affairs. That's what the Russians are saying. We've done something similar in Grenada. We, we've done it in, in Chile with, under Allende and, and in Guatemala with Arbenz and Iran with Mossadegh and more recently in, with Zelaya, the president of Honduras we overthrew three years ago. And of course in Iraq and Vietnam. Mm-hmm. I mean, so what, what I'm speaking out about these days in, in my own country is to say, hey, you know, um, yeah, uh, let, let, let Ukraine be a sovereign state. Let's protect that right. But let's not worry quite so much about what's going on there and let's worry an awful lot more about what, what our own country is doing in the world. Yeah, you almost need the no agenda jingle there. Hot kettle calling. <laughs> Ex- yeah, exactly. You know, it's very hypocritical of our government to come down on, on Russia and, and China or any other country uh, and not admit that what we've done is made some horrible mistakes and then to commit to us changing. Yes, let's keep Russia and China out of places like Ukraine and Tibet, and let's also commit to keeping ourselves out of other people's business. Hmm. I've heard people talk about Putin trying to, to create this Eurasian Union. Right. No. I have, I have no doubt about what he is and, and that the, the European Union and the United States and Canada are very much involved in trying to get those former Soviet countries to become part of the European Union. And they've mm-hmm. been pretty successful in many cases. And I think that's a lot of what this is about. It's, it's, it's almost like a revisiting of the old Cold War. Hmm. So H- Hoodwinked was, was a, a great read. Is, this, is that the, the end for you? Are you going to uh, keep them coming? Like, I oh, mean, you're I'm, optimistic. Like. A lot of people are doom and gloom and don't think we're we're getting out of this. But you, I mean, you still think there's time? Oh, absolutely, <laughs> there's time. You know, we and as I said earlier, I've seen tremendous changes in the last ten years, and even more in the last five years, and in the last couple of years, huge things happening around the world. And you know, ten years is a blink in human history. It seems like a long time when you're in the trenches, but it's really a blink in human history. My best book is, so far, I just uh, finished writing. I'm in the process of doing some editing on it now. It'll, it'll come out within the next year. It's called Confessions of an Economic Hitman 2, The Untold Story. And in it, I tell stories when I was an economic hitman that I did not have the guts to tell in the first book. 
And I also get bring us up to date and talk about a lot of what's going on in the world today and how to change it. And while I'm editing that book, I'm working on another book, which is which is going to be very exciting too. So, yeah, you know, that's what I do. I'm a writer, and that's what I love to do. You know, I'm, I'll never retire. So, I wonder if if uh, all the latest uh, suicides from the bankers are going to fall into one of those books. Have you <laughs> have you heard about what's going on there? I mean, I, I we haven't looked too, or I haven't looked too deep into it. I don't really know, but um, it it's interesting to hear some of the crazy ways uh, these banks bankers are are dying and you wonder if there's some sort of uh, clamp down on some whistleblowing that was going to happen. You have to, you have to wonder about that. And yeah, I mean, that's, that's a very legitimate question. And I am looking into that also this. Yes. And more to come. (laughs) Well, we'll have to have you on when, uh, again, when, when your uh, next book comes out. I'd love to. Thank you. Yes. Keep, and you guys are doing great work. I mean, this is so important. I think you know, speaking out like this is, is, is such a large part of it. And, and this is another thing that gives me great hope is that, you know, you're doing this. And there's lots of people doing it all over the world. Uh, and I'm speaking at conferences a great deal. I, as I said, I was just in Istanbul speaking to 2,000 corporate executives on these very subjects, wow. encouraging them to change, to move forward, to realize that if they want to be successful in business, they've got to orient their businesses toward a life economy. That's what I was speaking about with them. And, uh, and I'm, I'm headed for Geneva in a couple of weeks and then speaking in uh, the Bahamas and then in, uh, where next? I don't know, Caracas in Venezuela and then Panama. And you know it's 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 a very very exciting time all over the world. We've got uh, we've got people waking up. Yeah, we're collected. Our consciousness is collected through technology now. Do you think, uh, our gen- oh, Do you think um, like uh, our this generation that's coming up now will it will will uh, live to s- reap the benefits? I'm I'm sure of it. Um, you know, I love the fact that this generation, what we generation. Y or Z or double Z or the millennials. I mean, there's many different, uh, you know, it's, 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 it, it, it spans several generations, actually. And But so many the young people, you don't have to tell them that we have an environmental or social crisis. They, they go up knowing that. They, mm-hmm. They've got it already. Uh, and, you know, they've got a very different outlook on life than my generation, for example. They Sure, they want to have a good life, and but they realize that having a good life doesn't just mean making more money. It means having more free time. It means spending more time with your family and doing the things that you really want to do, whether that's art or writing or dance or music or whatever, but having time for that and having freedom. And also, they're very driven by a desire to do good things, to do things that are bigger than themselves. They're not happy with just doing something because it makes money. They want to do things because they feel good about what they're doing. And I find that extremely encouraging. Well, we want to, I guess we should start wrapping it up here. We want to thank you for, obviously, for your courage and, and your hope, too, and bring in some light to, uh, to what a lot of people get stuck in, in the darkness here. Well, thank you. And it's uh, what I would say is that it, 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 it's not about courage. It's about enjoying life and having fun. You know, I mean, I, I really enjoy what I do now. I, I, it's, you, there's nothing more blessed to do in the world than to work toward creating a better world uh, for ourselves and, and for future generations. That's a lot of fun. You know, we've got to have fun doing it. That's, that's, I, said, I mentioned passion and skills. The other thing that we need to bring into this is make sure we have fun doing it. And it is fun. There's nothing more blessed. As you guys know, you're doing it too. You're having fun doing it, right? Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. And, <laughs> and, and it is. It's changing our, our lives and following our passion. And, and that's one of the reasons why we do this is because you can't just talk to everybody in your normal life about these topics. But when you come on here like this and talk to fascinating guests like yourself. and you Find a lot of, lot of friendly people. Yeah. And you, right. and you start connecting with uh, like-minded people and people that want to think uh, open-mindedly and out of the box. So. All over the world, including at the top of big corporations, uh, people want to change, and a lot of them just don't know what to do. Corporate executives, I'll tell you one last thing, that, and that is that uh, I know a number of very high corporate executives that will tell you, 
we, I want to leave a green legacy, but I know that if I lose market share, I don't have a justification for doing things. I may lose my job. Mm. The board will fire me. Uh, and so they like nothing better than to get tons of emails saying, Hey, you guys do a better job, be greener because they can then take that to their executive committees, their boards of directors and say, Hey, listen, these are our customers speaking. We better follow what they want. Before, uh, before we let you go, John, is there any place other than uh, the books, obviously, which we'll link to uh, in the show notes and uh, the main site, johnperkins.org. Is there any place else our listeners can track you down? Are you on the Twitter or the Facebook? Yeah, I'm on both Twitter and Facebook. And dreamchange.org, one of the organizations I founded, is doing some very, very exciting things. And I encourage people to go to dreamchange.org. We have an incredible executive director, a young woman who is just a dynamo. And we're entering some fascinating new areas, which are about changing corporations and the education system. So I'd really encourage people to go there. And if they have something that they want to do and volunteer or, or work with us, uh, they can contact Samantha through that website. All right. Well, thanks for uh, being so open with us. And we didn't even get into the education thing. Next time we'll have to, to talk about that some more. I look forward to it. Thank you, guys. Keep, keep up your great work. Thanks. You can talk shit, but you ain't worth shit. I'll be slave, bitches, whining while their time ticks. I ain't like you others. Get my power from another. Dimension, brother. Time to get that dirty money. You can talk shit, but you ain't worth shit. I'll be slave, bitches, whining while their time ticks. I ain't like you others. Get my power from another. Dimension, brother. Time to get that dirty money. And that was our chat with John Perkins, the ex-economic hitman and best-selling author. Yeah, yeah, that was a good one. He's, uh, fuck, he must have had an interesting life, eh? Yeah. Walk a mile in that guy's shoes. Traveled around all over the place. I'm on, I was on overload a little bit. Uh, I've been just pounding the audiobooks into my head and reading that, uh, creating a, a real wealth economy from from Finley Eversole and uh, combine that with uh, the Estelin books and uh, John Perkins books. So I'm on overload a little bit. I had so many things to ask him, but uh, yeah, I wanted to keep it original and he was, uh, it's very good to, to hear how open he was. Yeah. He was super accommodating and uh, it's too bad we were limited on time. John's a busy man, but uh, hopefully we'll just have him on again, you know, uh, six or seven months down the road, we'll have him on again and, Keep, uh, keep the conversation going. Did you remember his shamanic journey from one of the books? I, it's, I, I totally forgot about that. No, I think that's in his earlier books. Oh, really? Yeah. That's ah. one, I didn't really know much about the earlier books, so I'm going to have to go back and see. Because, yeah. I mean, he all of a sudden, he, this he's going to have crossover into some other guests we've talked about, I think. Rolling Thunder and... You know, I did. I that caught me off guard. I must say, I wasn't prepared for the shamanism and indigenous people books. That caught me off guard for sure. But hey, it's just another side. Isn't that cool though? How that uh, that opening or that shamanic journey or the the you could call it a spiritual experience if you want. Uh, also, just changes. It overlaps with a lot of other shows, and it changes the path people are on, right? Well, yeah, and he was even talking about consciousness, like uh, you yeah. know, the same stuff yeah, we're talking just, about Grant it, Cameron with. Yeah, it's and, crazy. Uh, you know, it all it all comes together, which is kind of funny because you go into this one thinking it's going to be kind of a different thing. You know what I mean? It's yeah. uh, banking. all economic yeah, and banking, exactly. And uh, next thing you know, we're talking about consciousness and connecting with people, and shamans. Yeah, shaman. Um, so yeah, big thanks to John for coming out. Of course, you guys can, uh, we'll link to all the places you can find his books in the show notes and, uh, link to his Twitter and all that good stuff. So you guys can, can, uh, check out a little bit more on your own. Um, who we got coming up next is going to be, uh, Dr. Don Easterbrook. Dr. Don, yeah. Dr. Don Easterbrook. He Mr. Was, Freeze. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Freeze. He was a cool guy, man. I liked, uh, talking to Dr. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Yeah. It was refreshing. I wasn't sure what to expect going into that one, but he was he was a pretty chill cat. So yeah, and uh, chill cat. That one could turn into we might that could be the first episode that we really rock the boat on because a lot of the motherfuckers are real touchy on their global warming. 
and global cooling yeah yeah so but i'm looking forward to that as a great chat that'll be our next one out um and I think that's about it, guys. Thanks for listening. Of course, will be links to everything you heard of in the show notes, uh, all the music you heard. Email us. Yeah, we've been getting emails. It's always great to hear from people. Hopefully, we can respond. Hopefully, I'm, I uh, I don't lose lose the email. I've lost a couple so far, but uh, we read them all. That's for sure. Yep. Email us. Uh, review us where you can. iTunes reviews help. Uh, Check out the webpage, grimerica.ca. Click on the contact page from yep. there. Yep, exactly. And uh, check out the money bomb while you're at it. <laughs> uh, so that's it for this week, Grim. If you don't have anything else. No, that's it, buddy. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks for listening. And we will see you guys next week. Our tea is catching up with John Perkins, economist, activist, and author. One of his best-selling books, Confessions of the Translated into over 30 languages. It is an insider's account of the alleged exploitation of third world countries Yo. by the American government. Kiala Swiss Basili ni weka kwa danger Wise men waka show king and poison kwa menja Shepherds waka sacrifice Kondo kwa leopards ritual ziba kufanya kuwanda ka nomad In situ katia jitu na umbwa mwitu Mimtoto mchanga mbona kunyanda manavisu Juha wange stomach kilichota biriwa ma prophet wote Walio nitaja wali kashifiwa Fought all kwa scroll standard na old Nilingoja mwangaza kutangaza justice na hope But ka slave walitaka ni cheki hangi mkwa robes kabla ni zali Wali seti kamba kwa pole Roho za chuma, tamaya, pesa na gold Kwa castle, soli roll Juu ya pombe na hose, wish zao Zili sao, story ya bega na hose Niko njiani, na kam kubo more their doors Jina yangu revolution Nani na grow, nilikuwa size ya mustard seed But GMO, mli import Nili swallow, nikiwa msmo Nafta mahindi na mbolea Kuibiwa store, neza nita bastard Zina baba, mta nikumbuka kam Toi alikiwa kansa Ambayo, mli create, mka infect Wana inchi msidhani, mta Keep fire burning na kunimbiji Hamna haya Kuunda slogans na chant Usha sahau Watoi miacha ofan kwa camps Neza andika verse Niweke proverbs na some metaphors But still as ita lipuwa njini masham Na jana unemployed youth Jua pombe haram Machoko shupo kwa nyananga Simu kwa jam Na jana innocent fugitives On the run Plus small boys Walikuwa molested na nuns Ndege hawezi afford kujami ya miti Tunawalisha kisha mna tutapiki ya sisi Philosophy twisted Nihu discuss kwa ofisi na ona marita Wananganga ni aviti Laizenyo ni white Kami kono za lepa lakini misi blind Misi kengeza mini hala ikikubwa Siwezi fit gereza Angel of vengeance Siwezi fit jeneza Ulicheki vile pacha wangu walifanya Tunisia Egypt na pia ma street za Libya Blood ya Gandhi Gavi She Guevara Kwa mishipa kimati Mandela Mini fosa iju kabila So be afraid Be very afraid Na kuja na stampede Hayo go Big grenades, black parades, zime choka na charades, clock in a dick soon, ta shout my name, revolution. Even talk about how simultaneously to destroy free societies, big British and US banks predominantly. Republic ni akafira time ya happening ni future public ndo hadira ni kifunga macho na kupuka After ambush kwa ghetto wali nidia pingu wati niliongoza protest kuka wana darkness kwa pingu Angalau nilishukuru hawako ni vutia trigger Hivi ndivu kwa mbilia ziu poteza mafatha figa Extra judicial killing za love kwa jali haina kinga Kotini nyundo ya Shylock justice to the highest bidder Nikatuma prison huku nikingwa jakamba kwa shingo Charge ili kwa nitrizo na tinili kwa kina maribel Meditate kila wakati kwa kuta za gereza mandishi kwa Buddha, revolution kuyeneza Uwezo kwa mikono yako, uneza lead the people Hiyo ndo papa selef yako, na usijo kwa kopa kifo Nime kubia tulpuafu, ya kuandika pia hip hop Kingdom ya heli na rise, mikono za babi no rip off Mindo spirit ita inspire maka polisi kwa prison Wapato na knowledge, enlightenment pia na wisdom Watavu wa uniform, na wangu shembali mba weapon Utumishi kwa wode, mini force ya kurekon Nitabadilisha system ya bwenyenye na maslave masters Nitawa transform on the silly ways to Damascus Watabli 
Which my agreement under table contracts and charters Nita tumia ma preacher, ma poet and doctors Buried in oblivion, ma refugee in the golden Viongozi wali nest feathers, covid under golden Huku gabi atajiri na maskini kiziti kuproden Humanity ni vachu wali amoi kwe downtrodden Internally conscious ili kwa fit, dirty and sodden Swollen, na greed sodden, na kagoza apathy na human need Hatu kufollow ma leader, ni mafisi zili take the lead Wame tufunza hatred, mitani red ziema ni historia na bleed Hatujui past, uko bond kwe rudia ya knowledge ilifanyo rubbishing majina za mahiro zili tupwa kwa rubbish bin full na mita zili nemi of the mahiro kalu mungwa ni wakati wa kufukuza mashetani tulifuga hawezi tuzwia nyuma yetu tukona mungu mungwa tunganisha umati kila kabila na kila luga tunganisha renya vc fist bila kidole kumba the revolution we know be telling by still make one song ni time ya kuperform the dances moves is equal on with time viongozo wali report wa kubuto kwa limousine wengine execution in public wali face the guillotine no more politicians wali jihamina Uli mia swindla Dictators na migu ya mpuni Tumbandovu shingu ya twiga Second liberation ikafanyika Uldoda ikakwa kpon Raya wali enjoy the oxygen New country ikakwa pon Yo How simultaneously Romy To destroy free societies Big British and US banks Revolution The Bolsheviks and the Nazis And of course the fascists Originating the Nazis Damn it